Hello everybody, welcome to number 27. Today I am beyond excited to be with these two particular cars, two absolute heroes of mine. Why am I comparing two cars which at first glance might seem so completely and utterly different? Well, it's because they are both, for me, the most significant sports cars of their era. The Lamborghini Miura was the first production mid-engined supercar, sports car and it completely changed everything. The Toyota 2000 GT really showed us what Japan was capable of. Now, at first glance, they go about achieving their aims in very different ways. But we're going to find out that there are actually some similarities between them as well as some massive differences. So in this video, I'm going to talk about both cars. So first of all, visually, the details, the interiors. Then we're going to talk about the development story of each car, which again is really quite typical of where they're from. I'm going to look at the technical details, the chassis, the suspension, the engines. And then lastly, we are going to be talking to the fabulous Ian Tyrrell, who's one of the few people who knows both cars really intimately. And we're going to be talking to Ian about how they drive. Both cars were featured in blockbuster films. The Toyota, actually in a James Bond film, You Only Live Twice. Sean Connery was so tall and the car was so small, as you'll see in a minute, that in order to make it work, they had to make two bespoke Toyota 2000 GTs, which were convertibles. The Mura's performance in the Italian job is possibly even more iconic. It's just incredible. So first of all, let's compare some stats between the two, things like the original pricing, weight, power to weight, and so on. And this is where they initially appear quite different. So the Mura, which by the way, has quite an interesting link to the Mini, and I'll talk about that later. So it owes something to the original Mini. But 764 Muras were built. Um, it weighs 1,290 kilos, although it depends on which model you look at. There were three various itinerations of that, and again, we'll look at that, but I think the most attendable weight is probably about 1,300 kilos. That gives it a power to weight ratio, again, depending on the model, but of around 200 brake horsepower per tonne. Not to 60 is in seven seconds. It top speed, again, depending on the model, is between 170 and 180 miles an hour, which is just inconceivable for the, the late 60s when this car was around. It's just incredible. And at launch, it cost $20,000, which is as much as five, five Corvettes. But let's go now to the 2000 GT, to the Toyota. Only 337 were built, so less than half of the number of Muras. Power was 148 horsepower, so that means Weight was 1,120 kilos, so probably about 150 kilos to 200 kilos lighter than the Mura. It's slightly smaller, as you can see in the pictures, but mainly lengthwise, but mainly it's a little bit narrower. Power to weight is 134 bhp per ton, so definitely much less in terms of outright power than the Mura. 0 to 60, 8.4 seconds. Top speed, 137 miles an hour. And when new, it cost $7,230, which actually was a massive amount for a Toyota. It was more expensive than a base 911, and it was about $2,000 more than the equivalent E-Type at the time. The development of these cars is really quite typical of the different cultures that they represent. So the development of the 2000 GT is really quite straightforward. Uh, Yamaha was in talks with Nissan and had already produced a prototype of a sports car that they, won't go, they were going to do together. Nissan then decided that it wanted to go its own way. And conveniently at the time, Toyota needed a standard bearer, something to lift the image of the company, which at the time was making some quite sort of dull, boring products. So it was a perfect marriage of convenience. The only difference was that the original Nissan Brief wanted a more everyday car and Toyota wanted something absolutely top end. So a few details were changed. But aside from that, it was pretty straightforward. Satoru Nag Nagasaki, I think, was the designer in terms of this fantastic body, which I think looks absolutely incredible. The car came out and it was really very little change during its life cycle. There were some detail changes in terms of the lights and so on, but the main design of the car, 
the technical design remained totally unaltered. And that is completely different and really contrasts with what happened with the Mura. Now, although heavily anglicized, I am actually Italian of origin and I know that Italians can be incredibly flamboyant, they can be very creative, but organization isn't always the top of the skill list. And the Mura shows that in a way. It's just so different from the Toyota. The designs of both cars show it as well. In terms of the way they look, in terms of some of the designs, if you look at those, the knockoffs on the wheel, they are so different. That's nice, but it's pretty functional. That is so crazy. But anyway, let's get back to it. This car was designed by three guys who are all under 25. Like essentially almost still children really that were just let loose and came up with this absolutely incredible concept for the time. The fact that the engine was a mid-engine, that had only happened before in race cars and I think there was one prototype car that had it as well. But it's the development and it's the way it was released that also reflects on that sort of different approach and culture. There was not one version of the Mura, there were three different versions because when the Mura was released, it wasn't really ready and it had some quite odd issues and things that needed to be sorted. For a start, at over 100 miles an hour, it generated significant front end lift. Secondly, the engine, although it was a fantastic new design and it was transverse and it incorporated the gearbox within the engine casing like a Mini, and that's what I meant before when I said that they were, there was a link there. But in order to try and make it fit, they decided to use the same lubrification, both for the gearbox and for the engine, which is a really massive no-no. It just doesn't work very well. And also it meant that all but 97 of the original Muras, of all the Muras actually, they weren't able to be fitted with a limited slip diff for that particular reason. But I digress. The point I'm trying to make is they had to continually develop it throughout its life cycle. The three designers of the Mura were Stanzini, Dallara and Bob Wallace. And there's a really funny story about Bob Wallace, which gives you an idea of how this car was developed. And that is, they used to take it out on the Italian autostradas going to Rome and going to Milan. And they used to sort of compete for who could get the best times. Because in those days, well, actually still, there were toll booths, which gave you the different times when you went from one booth to the other. And at one point, Bob Wallace went from Modena to Milan, and I can't remember if it was an hour that he did it in, an hour and 20 minutes, but the point was he averaged, they worked out that he did an average speed even of 150 miles an hour. This is going back to the 60s on Italian autostradas of the time with cars which would have been barely breaking 55, 60 miles an hour. So you can see how just how incredible and how Italian the development of that car actually was. As well as the things I've already said, the first version also suffered from pretty lackluster handling. That was called the P400. The 400S, which came afterwards, took some features of the car and improved them. It had different suspension pickup points at the back, making the handling much more predictable. They improved the interior. They changed some of the exterior details, such as having chrome trim. They had wider wheels and tires, and the car generally was just much easier to live with and much easier to drive. One more detail that I want to mention is that when the P400S first came out, one of the changes that, that came with the car was that they had optional air conditioning. Now the car cost £20,000 new, and the option of air conditioning cost $800 at the time. For only $400 more, you could get a whole new Fiat 850. The 400 SV was a further evolution. Again, like the S I mentioned to say, the S also had some sort of engine fettling as well. So it produced, I think, another 20 horsepower. The SV had more fettling, produced another 15 horsepower, I think bringing it up to 380 horsepower. And again, there were differences to the chassis. And the last, I think, 86 cars, finally had different, they had a, a sort of a separation within the, um, within the block for the gearbox lubricant and oil and engine oil. So they were able to fit limited slip diffs. The last version of the Mura is by far the best to drive. But one of the issues with it is that these fantastic details, these eyelashes disappeared, which is a real shame. Although far less aggressive, 
I do really like the Toyota 2000 GT. Now this was actually designed, although it's a Bertone car, it was designed by the then up and coming Marcello Gandini. And it is full of flair and details. And the things I was talking about before are, look at these, I know this isn't maybe what Gandini looked at, but look at the design of these knockoffs. They are so exuberant. The way the, the way that the car sort of flows backwards, the vents on the side there, the sloping back with these sort of flat back bars, it is a fabulous design. Fittingly, the Toyota had quite a functional name. It was the Toyota 2000 GT. Not really much about that. That reflects the engine, which was a two litre inline six cylinder. The Lamborghini, on the other hand, the Mura, that was named after a breeder of fighting bulls in Seville in Spain. In terms of engines, these cars are very, very different. The Mura had a 3.9 litre V12, which was a development of an engine which was already in use in other Lamborghinis. In this application though, it was transverse instead of longitudinal. So they had to re-engineer the gearbox side of things and they decided in order to make it fit to incorporate the gearbox in one casting. So the gearbox is underneath the engine. You can't even see it here. It's got some other interesting touches as well in that this engine actually has no flywheel because it has to have a transfer case going from the engine into the gearbox with gears. The weight of those gears is deemed enough for it not to need an extra flywheel. It was a really powerful beast for the time because in the different iterations of this car, it put out between 350 to 380 horsepower and it revved to the then incredible 8,000 RPM. Now that V12 in the Lamborghini may be an incredible engine, but it really isn't actually that much to look at. The inline six in the Toyota, which has far, far more humble origins, it's a much prettier thing in the engine bay. Now the bottom end of this engine came from the then Toyota Crown, a pretty run of the mill car. Yamaha, however, re-engineered the top end with double overhead cams. It managed to put out 148 horsepower at 6,600 RPM. So not quite as heady, uh, as that car, but still a really fantastic, lovely little engine. And technically, in terms of the chassis, these two cars would at first appear to be completely different. This is front engine, that is mid engine, this is longitudinal with the gearbox off the back, that has the gearbox incorporated and it is a mid engine transverse car. But there is one thing that brings them a little bit closer together, and that is how far back Toyota managed to move the weight of the engine. If you can see from the side, the, the whole engine actually sits behind the center of the axle line. So although it is front engined, it's almost sort of front center engined, and it's incredible that they managed to engineer it in that way. The chassis on the 2000 GT is an X-shaped center spine. It has double wishbones all around. It has disc brakes as well, which was a first for a Japanese car at the time, disc brakes all around. And importantly, it has a limited slip diff. The 2000 GT was also the first Toyota to offer rack and pinion steering. The Lambo, on the other hand, had a monocoque chassis, so much more, well, pretty much more advanced on that side of things, which incorporated the roof. And then two separate clams, which were in, made out of aluminium. It also had double wishbones, disc brakes all around. Both cars had five speed gearboxes, but the Toyota does trump this in that it had limited slip diff. I was expecting the Toyota to be far better built than the Mura, but I'm actually quite pleasantly surprised. The door, for example, is really nice and solid, and it has a very solid action opening and closing. The door feels very solid, the lock mechanism, the really pretty little mechanism which incorporates the fins. Again, nice and solid. Even the catch there to open the rear clamp is quite a nice thing and feels pretty solid. You'd think it might be quite flimsy in Italian sort of supercar 60s style, but it's not bad. Everything is covered in leather and it appears to be missing the plethora of switches which you would think would appear in an Italian car of this era. What we have are the two window controls from the S forward. Uh, power windows were at least an option if not standard. The original had winders which were quite hard to use. Uh, the jets for the 
for the screen, for the wipers, obviously your fantastic gear change here, uh, which is amazing. But there's not, apart from that and from the stalk here, there isn't really much to confuse you. That's because a lot of the switch gear on the S again was moved up to this center tunnel here. So there's a vent for the air, and then there are various switches. There's the wiper switch, there's the speed for the wipers, um, lights, fan, and I think that's also fan speeds. Um, but generally, it's not too bad for an Italian car of this era. I'd find it pretty usable. The quality, you know, it all feels, it all feels pretty solid and it's really nice to look at. The Toyota though is undoubtedly on another level. Now, unfortunately, I would never be able to drive this car because I simply don't fit in it. I can get in at a standstill like this, but my left knee is really wedged up against the dashboard and I wouldn't trust myself to drive it. But this interior is fantastic. The wood veneer, it really is. I, I think it's amongst the best I've ever seen on a car. You can see the influence of Yamaha who did the interior and had their section, their piano section essentially do that. But also everything in here is on another level to the Lambo. It's not bad, the Lambo, but I think Ian Tyrrell in his video described it as jewel-like. That is a word that is often too, too often used on my channel, but it really is incredible. The switch gear, that's the radio antenna. The switch gear is just fantastic. Even the way, although I'm not driving it, you can feel the way the gear change moves is just, oh, it's just incredible. It's absolutely lovely. The instrumentation, the little chrome bezels, the interior really is fab. It's such a shame that it's such a cramped car, but I absolutely love it. Let's find out how they differ in the drive by going and talking to Ian Tyrrell. Hi Ian, how are you doing? Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. You're one of the rare people who has driven both cars, who knows them as well, in terms not just driven them, but knows them technically. You've worked on both. Um, and so it would be really good, I think, for the video for you to just give us your thoughts on what they're like to drive and just anything else that you wish to share, really. I mean, I, I echo your uh, your comments about getting in and out of them. Uh, I don't know what, if you saw on my last video, I, I almost made a joke of getting in the 2000 GT because, well, no, I didn't almost, I did. Um, it was, it's just so tiny. It really is. It makes an MGB GT look like a minibus, really. Yeah, I mean, it's, they are two very different cars. Um, they're both children of the 60s, of course. Uh, second half of the 60s, actually, aren't they? But the... Um, conceptually they were both aiming to produce something incredibly unusual and wonderful but they went about it very very different ways really I mean the Mura was a, a big it, it's a brutish car the Mura it's it's quite intimidating to drive um it sort of makes its case felt it's a bit like a fighting bull really you, you sort of you sit in the driver's seat and you, you're you're signing up for fighting this bull that's that's almost what it's like really with this massive V12 engine, literally, you know, 10 inches behind your head, if you're lucky. Um, <clears throat> whereas the, the 2000 GT is more of a thing of finesse, really. Um, they, uh, Toyota based the chassis on sort of Lotus technology, really, you know, back, back, steel press, steel backbone, very tiny suspension arms. And in fact, I can send you some photographs of the suspension if you want to include those as well. It's very, it's all very fine and it almost looks too light to be fit for purpose, really, which it was very much the Lotus ethos. Colin Chapman said, if it just makes it a foot over the finishing line, I'm happy. You know, that was how he made his racing cars. And Toyota most certainly don't work like that, but the car is very fine and I use the analogy in my video of it being sort of dual like really the 2000 GT and that's what it's like to drive. It's all, you know, you can change gear with your little finger. Um, it's all terribly clickety clackety and, you know, beautiful and fine. Every last mechanical fastener, every last piece of material and steel has been poured over by Japanese, you know, obsessives wearing white gloves. You almost get the feeling, you know, <laughs> whereas the Mura was a, a raw statement. And that, that really does come through. And uh, they're, they're both halo products. 
for their manufacturers at the time, but they came from very different angles and ended up with very different results. The, the 2000 GT is your friend, the Miura is your, is your challenge. So the Miura um, at the time was a, a genuine 170 mile an hour car. The, uh, there's quite a lot of luggage space in the 2000 GT. Not that there isn't in the boot of a Miura, actually they're surprisingly spacious, but the 2000 GT is, it's a bit more rounded as an engineering project. The Miura caught Lamborghini um, off balance because they showed, they showed the bare chassis, first of all, in 65, and then the finished car in 66. And all of a sudden people were placing orders with them. And that wasn't really the way Toyota did it. They, they nailed it first time. Fantastic. Now, I believe uh, at one point you actually had two 2000 GTs in your workshop, which again, extremely rare thing to happen. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, um, we did. We just happened to have, and it worked out very well because uh, the JHW car that you've been looking at was uh, was missing a few bits. So James here was able to replicate those and we got them chromed and, you know, um, so that came together really well. And lastly, is one easier to work than the other or are they both just challenging in different ways? The 2000 GT, the fact that it's a front engine rear wheel drive car, makes a huge difference in mechanical complexity. It, it's much simpler than the Miura. Uh, the Miura has got that enormous engine, but also a five-speed uh, gearbox with synchromesh even on reverse, which was unheard of in the 60s. All that complexity, transaxle, transfer gears, clutch, all built into a small area. There's a lot going on there. And yeah, the Miura is more of a, it's more of a challenge to work on. The, the, the 2000 GT is sort of conventional in that sense, really. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much to Ian, who is just one of the ni nice, knowledgeable and nicest people in motoring. And also thank you to JHW Classics. Both of these cars are part of that collection. They do rent their cars out for films, events, things of that kind. So do have a look at their website. I'll put the link in the video description, but thank you so much to them for letting me spend some time with both of these cars. If you have a car that you want me to do a video on, do get in touch with me. Instagram is the best way. Thank you so much for watching. Please do subscribe because it really helps and I really look forward to seeing you for the next video.